So welcome back, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Comp 5 to 6, Efficient Algorithms. Um, we're starting a fresh new topic. We'll talk about strings for, for a while, uh, not just this unit, but uh, we'll start um, nice and simple. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about what's, what strings are for us. And then specifically, this unit will be about string matching, finding subsets in, in a large text. Again, something uh, some of you will have seen. We'll then uh, build on that and go a little deeper than you would usually go. The learning outcomes for, for this unit are uh, know some basics about strings. If you haven't seen this before, it's just uh, something ubiquitous in, in all of programming and computer science. Uh, there's a few concrete algorithms we'll look at, the knuth morris Pratt, boyer moore and raven Karp algorithms. That's what these abbreviations stand for. And uh, as always, like for the sorting unit, I want you to not just be able to execute the algorithms, but understand when they are good and when they are not so good. And uh, we'll look a little bit at building blocks that you can use to solve other problems. Because it turns out people don't always just want to find substrings. Uh, big surprise. I subtitled the unit as what's behind control F. I mean, for all Mac users, whatever the shortcut is there. Uh, today, you could even say, what's behind search? Uh, that would just be a slightly bit lying. Um, think of this as finding the text in a text editor. Uh, it's a little different if you have a search engine that can pre-process the text, but we'll come to that as well. I want to start with um, some basics about text and string. And uh, although this is quite, um, quite elementary, uh, the formal way to define strings and work with them in a mathematical setting is, uh, it, it could be new for a few. So I, I want to briefly uh, recap that. Well, as a string is just a sequence of characters. So you hopefully know what a sequence should be. Now, a character can be pretty much anything. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to more restrictions on that. Some examples of where strings arise, uh, any kind of English text or other language text, source code and websites, and uh, pretty much everything essentially is converted to a text is a, because it is a very natural format for us and computers. Despite some exa exceptions, much of computers is one dimensional in a way. We organize memory one dimensional. And so it's, it's quite natural to also do this for the data that we work with. And some things like XML documents, they're effectively a tree, right? It's a tree structure, but uh, you can encode it as a text. And so many things we do for text are a little more general than they first appear because you can map so many things back to text. Okay, when I say text, uh, that's the same as string, it's just, I don't know, a string sounds short and text sounds long, <laughs> but there's no formal, formal difference. Okay, because it is applied in so many different contexts, it's not surprising that there's different requirements and different algorithms, depending on what you want to do. The task we will focus on for this unit is to find a short pattern in some long text. So we find exact occurrences of some pattern string. And so, that's what usually control F, at least in the text editor does. Uh, many searches are slightly smarter these days. They try to also find things if you mistype them, or at least if you mistype them in the typical ways that other people have mistyped them. Uh, but we'll, we'll focus on the exact one first. There's a classic Unix tool, grab, that basically does this and, and more. Uh, F grab if you want to be specific. And at least the core of virus scanners still works like this. They also have additional heuristics, but um, they still have signature databases. So they have little snippets of machine code that they are looking for because these are known to occur in known viruses. So they're, they're really looking for, for substrings, exact matches as, as their core principle. And the reason why they still do this is that it's so fast. Many of these other heuristics are smarter and better at finding threats that are slightly changed from what has been seen before and so on and so forth. But their uh, basic text search is so fast, it's still 
is still useful as a baseline. Yeah, as for sorting, it's it's often a building block for for further things. So what are what are strings for us? Um, I already said it's a sequence of characters, so we should know what a character is, and uh, we'll just talk about alphabets. So uh, here's the first <laughs> first Greek letter of this. It's a capital sigma, same as the sum sign, but not the same symbol, right? It's it's a Greek letter, capital capital sigma, and uh, we use that to denote the alphabet. The only thing we really restrict here is that it should be a finite set, so you you can write down the alphabet once and for all. Uh, it's convenient to have a notation for the size of the alphabet, so that's the little sigma, or at least one version of it. Um, so we use these two, keep that in mind. Standard types of alphabets are just the letters we use in, in English and other languages, but it could be a bit bigger, it could include all the emojis, uh, I forgot to look up the, the latest stats. I think it was around 200,000 characters in the Unicode standard. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit. They, they keep adding more emoji and more, <laughs> more other super valuable things, all the Klingonic scripts and whatever. Uh, but even if you, if you are very liberal and include anything and everything that some, some group of people says, yeah, this is a thing, you end up with something like 200,000. It's a lot of characters if you wanted to write them down, but it's also just 200,000 if you think about it. Uh, in terms of computer memory, it's not such a big deal. Uh, there's much smaller alphabets as well. Uh, this is from, from bioinformatics. Your, your genetic code is basically a, a four-letter alphabet. All right, many, many different alphabets, and uh, we'll usually keep that generic. We'll just say there's an alphabet sigma. Um, that's a single character. Now, to form sequences of, of these characters, we have different notations that are handy. If you just say sigma with a superscript n, you can say that's just the, the n-fold Cartesian product of this in, this in set notation. So that's all n-tuples, so it's all strings of length n, n characters. So you can write that very briefly as sigma to the n. Uh, people have these these two abbreviations that are, that are handy. Star means any n, and you take the union. That's what's spelled out formally here. And that includes the string of zero characters, which is called the empty string. So we'll, we'll have a, second, a, a separate symbol. I'll always use this, this uh, epsilon here to denote the empty string. It's just sometimes useful to write that. All programming languages would use quotes for strings. All, well, all that I'm... I can think of use quotes for strings, and so the empty string would just be quote quote. Um, to not write quotes all over the place, and you know all the hassle with escaping if you need the quote symbol inside a string and all of that. Uh, in, in the mathematical notation, we don't do that. We don't normally write quotes, and uh, so that's more concise. But it means you can only write the empty string if you have a special symbol. Uh, the plus as a superscript is the same as the star, but uh, starting at one. So all strings that are not empty. Um, and then because uh, a string is a sequence, we will model this as an array in a computer. And so the rest of the notation is um, derived from that. I'll, I'll write this bracket notation to say that's the ith character, but we start with zero, which is exactly what Python does, right? Uh, a string in Python is, is an array of characters, and so uh, in, in square bracket zero gives you the, the first character in the string. All right, uh, just a few more. So if you have two strings, you can just write them behind each other, and that means concatenation. Now, uh, it's a little unfortunate that in math terminology, the, the dot as multiplication is what people predominantly write for concatenation. This comes from group theory and uh, that, that people thought about strings as the free group over the alphabet and so on. And so the natural symbol for groups there is, is multiplication, not plus. I mean, this is a very weak justification, but uh, it's very firmly established. So if I write two strings and put a multiplication between them, that's concatenation, Python would use a plus. And um, most, most programming languages would use a plus. Uh, 
So that's just, um, I, I don't know if it makes a lot of sense to, to add this to the slide as well. I don't think I'm telling you new things at this point in the term. Uh, last piece is, uh, if we have a string, we will often want to speak about substrings, which is uh, a contiguous range, so a, a subrange of the array, same as we used for recursive calls of sorting algorithms. And so uh, sij is the substring where we include the endpoints, and we'll use this notation often as for arrays, so same, same just uh, different names for it. We call it a substring here. Uh, and two specific types of substrings are prefixes and suffixes. A prefix is a substring that starts with the first character or at position zero, and a suffix is someone that goes all the way to the end. All right. Any questions on the notation so far? Um, my suspicion is that much of that is repetition, but just to have a little check, let's do this little one. Just two answers, so I, I realize you can just guess, but maybe avoid the guessing. We've had a record-breaking 81 votes on the attendance code. So let's see. So we should definitely get 60, right? Or more. Curious where these 80 people are. It's not a not a trick question. Uh, so I think um, I'll leave it with 46. Most of you seem to know uh, that that's the same, and that's true. Uh, just to recap, so this is the set of all strings, including the empty one. So you can write this as non-empty strings and the empty string. All right. So what do we want to do with our strings? Let's formalize this finding patterns as well. Uh, and there's this one one caveat here where indeed you have some choice, so I'll point that out. Uh, the first is just the names, so we have two types of two, two strings involved in this problem. The input is a text and a pattern. So t will always have length n, so with our new fancy notation we can write it like that. And the pattern has length m, so uh, that's the where the two Two letters come from, and I'll I'll use that same same names for for many for uh, on many slides. So just uh, hope that sticks. And we usually think of the pattern being relatively short and the text relatively long, but that's not something that's part part of the definition. It's just uh, if you if you think about what are typically good algorithms, uh, that's something to keep in mind. Um, but it's not to say that you always have this. Now for the output, uh, this is a little ambiguous. So what we define here is we want to find the first occurrence or the first match of the pattern in the string. So that's formally the smallest index i, so that the pattern occurs starting at this position i in the text. All right. Now what would be the other option? Uh, it could occur several times. So you could just report all the indices. 
then you can get into a question, what, what about overlapping occurrences? If the pattern allows that, do you count all or both? So for, for here, we'll just break ties, say the first is all we want. And if you want more, you have to continue searching. Again, that's something in line with most programming languages. Python has this find function on strings that does by and large the same thing. Uh, of course, it can happen that there's no occurrence of p in the text, then there's some special return value. We'll just call that no match. Uh, you can also find all. We'll, we'll touch on that briefly later. But um, for now, you can just do this iteratively by asking for the first occurrence and then starting, well, taking the, the suffix of the original text and continuing from there. A quick example. Here's a, a text and here's a pattern. Now our problem says find the first occurrence. And so p occurs here. And remember, we start counting at 0. So that's return value 1, because that's at index 1. And for another pattern, which does not occur, you should return no match. OK? Good. Um, so far, so good. Let's hammer this point home. But I want this real quick. So, uh, Surely the connection will work. Let's try to do this real quick because it's a simple question. Should have probably hidden the, the results. Uh, either way, no one, no one disagrees. So <laughs> um, to not bore you to death. If you write the indices above each of the characters, then you see that position 3 is the P. And then you go up to position 7, but excluding position 7. That's the round parenthesis. So you take positions 3 to 6 inclusive, so that gives you p5 to 6. OK? Not too hard. OK, that's, that's just, uh, there's, there's so much confusion in the literature. So maybe this is, let's flip that over into a warning. If you read up elsewhere on strings, uh, always watch out for start the, do they start at 1, do they start at 0, are inclusive ex, uh, the substrings inclusive or exclusive of the endpoints. Um, there's just no consistency, so you always have to be a bit careful. Of course, it doesn't change the, the fundamental principles at all, but well. Maybe at this point, before we continue, let me ask, uh, what kind of string matching algorithms you've seen so that I can get a feeling a bit for uh, how fast we should go over this unit. I'm aware that there's always a few people who have not seen any of, any of this at all. Uh, in a way, my justification at MSC level is that it, it's fairly it's fundamental things. So even if you haven't seen them, uh, by now you've learned to digest this content faster than undergrads. Uh, and for those who have seen it, uh, <laughs> yeah, I love, the, I love this uh, specific string matching algorithm. Uh, Well, I mean, algorithm, uh, what I mean by algorithm is the way it works, not necessarily um, boasting with all the languages you've learned and how the string search method is called there. <laughs> okay, again, it's, um, it's tough to see from, from there. So brute force, nine people voted. Five people noted none. Uh, we're still just at 33, 34. 